So I, I think that that's the same thing. Like the experience has to be compelling enough to overcome that natural hurdle. And so where I ultimately gravitate to in thinking about the metaverse is it's going to be about those experiences that you want to be immersed in. Hey gang, it's Monday, February 7th. Andrew and listeners, welcome to the Behind the Numbers Daily, an e-marketer podcast made possible by Mountain. I'm Marcus, and today I'm joined by one of our principal analysts on our retail and e-commerce team. He goes by Andrew Lipsman. Hey, Marcus. Hey, chap. So today's myth, another myth for you. I'm on a bit of a myth streak at the minute. It's hard to come up with facts all the time, all right? So for crying out loud, give me a break. Are we debunking myths? We are. All right. So goldfish. I'm here for it. Have <laughs> Thank goodness. Thank goodness someone is. Goldfish have a really short memory, is the myth. However, research from the School of Psychology at the University of Plymouth in England in 2003 demonstrated that goldfish have a memory span of at least three months and can distinguish between different shapes, colors, and sounds and were trained to push a lever for a food reward. They knew exactly what time of day it was where they could push this lever and then get access to food. Also, goldfish don't swim into the side of the bowl because they can't see it. They're not stupid. They're using a pressure sensing system called the lateral line, which can help fish with low visibility to navigate. I feel bad for the goldfish now. This vicious rumor that they can't remember anything. Maybe they meant me. Maybe they meant Marcus when they said goldfish. So where did the myth come from? Who knows? I know who these people are who are peddling this rubbish. I mean, there's a whole movie built around that, right? Finding Dory. Yeah. Isn't the whole thing that she doesn't have a memory? Yeah. Yeah, I shouldn't I shouldn't even do these myths. They're ruining my perception of reality. <laughs> anyway, today's real topic, speaking of reality, <laughs> the bad parts of the metaverse and why it might not be the internet 2.0. So Andrew, we're talking all about the metaverse again today as part of our mini residency, if you can call it that. We're doing one, maybe two episodes a month about the metaverse because there's just a lot to talk about as things kind of blew up last year in terms of a lot of news coming out about different companies who are stepping into this, this world, this virtual world where you can work, play, shop, hang out using your digital avatars, a world which a lot of companies are expecting us to step into at some point soon. No one really knows. But Andrew, we wanted to talk in this episode, well, we want to talk about the, the kind of the bad parts of the metaverse, why this might not be a good idea. But you also wanted to start the show with discussing why you think that it might not be the next generation of the internet, which is what the metaverse has kind of been called. It's been called, you know, if you've got the internet, it's kind of very two-dimensional and everything you do is on a flat screen. And the metaverse is going to be much more interactive. You can go inside of the internet, basically, uh, through AR glasses or virtual reality headset seems to be the main gateway at the moment. But Andrew, what makes you think that the metaverse might not be the next generation of the internet? Yeah, well, so let me first back up and say that I've entered into these conversations with a really open mind and wanting to learn and think about the implications of the metaverse. But I also come in with sort of a healthy dose of, of skepticism, especially when there's something that's obviously significantly hyped and there are a lot of interests who kind of want to push this forward. But there's there's something that's been sort of nagging at me, which was an initial frame when Meta introduced their new name and their their vision of the metaverse. And it was this framing that the metaverse was the next platform, the next obvious platform, the successor to the mobile internet, I think was the exact language used. Mm -hmm. And to some extent, it seems like we've kind of accepted this frame. But I want to pick at that because the more I think about it, the more I don't accept that frame whatsoever. Hmm. I don't think it's the successor. And so I think that everything that we're you know, when we, when we enter into the hype cycle and we cast forward this vision of the metaverse as the next, you know, gargantuan thing, the next massive media channel and experience and all these sorts of things, I think we need to reconsider it for a moment. Okay. How come? Where's the skepticism coming from, Andrew? So first off, if you think about, well, let's start with Facebook. Facebook has every interest in making this a thing, right? They're furthest along in the hardware, software development, and they obviously have a reason to change the conversation and, and kind of reframe the company, right? So there's a, a very strong vested interest 
in that becoming true. And we also know that they've kind of had a long held obsession with having the next platform because they've been dependent on Google and Apple for, you know, in the era of the mobile internet. But I will say is that we can't just take this assumption that this is the next platform or even that there is a next platform as we can currently conceptualize it. Right. We've got two examples from fairly recent history that were also talked about in similar terms that did not pan out that way. The first hmm. one, the first one coming on the heels of smartphones was tablets, right? So that was supposed to be this next big platform and the iPad was obviously a very successful product and it's used for media co consumption today. But that platform I think is, has been sort of caught in the middle of a few different use cases. And, and let's be honest, for me, the use case for tablets today, other than my kids using them, you know, in every corner of the house, like the killer use case is having it on a plane to watch a movie because the screen is big enough, it's portable. But otherwise, in most cases, like you either want to use a computer or you want to use a TV or you want to use your phone. Yeah. So, so it's carved out a slice of media consumption time, but it, you know, it's less than 10% or so of digital media usage. So it's not the next big thing. It, it's got a place, it's got a slice, but it's not the next big thing. The other one that was entered into this hype cycle a few years ago is voice. Oh, yeah. searches are all going to move to voice search. And that's the next big, you know, we're going to have this ambient interaction with voice and that's going to become the next big platform. I'm looking at my watch, still waiting, right? <laughs> right. It's got a role. Right. It definitely plays a role. It exists mm -hmm. within many people's households. It, there's a certain level of ubiquity, but it's not a dominant media channel. It's not a mass marketing vehicle. So when I think about mass media vehicles, which I think is kind of the assumption here, if we're going to be talking about the metaverse and its implication for brands and marketers, is that it has to ultimately account for a huge amount of time spent, right? The dominant vehicles today then are TV, phones, smartphones. Yep. And, you know, even radio still is, is a, a pretty important yep. mass marketing vehicle. Mm -hmm. What do those three all have in common to drive that time spent? I'm going to answer my own question, Mark, because I'm not going to make you toil over okay, this. Okay, thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Could have been a really long pause. <laughs> They're heavily driven by passive media consumption. Mm. So if you think about it, right, TV, yep. it's still, people still watch it three, four, sometimes five hours a day. But yeah. a lot of that is it's, you know, ambient viewing of sports and news and maybe just throwing on prime time and watching American Idol or whatever the case may be. But this is, this is viewing that doesn't need you know, your full attention. If you think about smartphone time spent, so much of this is social media, you know, doom scrolling and basically just kind of mindless passive consumption of, of the internet. Um, in the radio, you know, you turn on a station, you listen to it in the car. Let's talk about the metaverse, right? Especially the virtual reality entry point. By virtue of the fact that you're putting on a headset, I think it, it is like by definition, not passive engagement. It is highly engaged, highly interactive engagement. And so to me, that kind of inherently limits the value as a mass media channel. So mm. I don't I don't know that it will ever get there. And I think the best parallel, we will often come back to this is gaming. I would say to most brands, I would say, why are we thinking about how we have our brand live in the metaverse if we haven't had that conversation yet about gaming? Because to me, gaming has a slice of the pie already. There's a lot of audiences who are engaged there. And there are better and better advertising opportunities in that platform, to me, like that's what's sitting in front of us. And maybe that evolves into the metaverse. But to me, that's kind of the advertising play. And I don't see that ever being a mass media vehicle. It can be an important one, but not the way that TV and, and you know, social media are. Okay. So a couple of questions for you. First of all, I mean, do you think this could be a learned behavior though? The same way that, you know, we spend a lot of time, um, particularly people who are in the professional services industry, who spend a lot of time on their computers, on their laptops, and you have to go sit at your desk, wherever that may be, and open up your laptop, fire that up. Could that be a learned behavior similar to putting on a virtual reality headset, especially if the cost comes down or if companies are buying these for you? Because we didn't, you know, you could argue that maybe with the smartphone, it, it, you couldn't imagine uh, having this thing, this little computer you carry around in your pocket all the time and pulling it out and accessing the app to go into that particular world. And that's become a, a kind of learned behavior over time. Could that be the case with a VR headset? I think the fact that it requires it to physically be on you and it's heavy, maybe mm. it will, you know, it'll get light over time. Fine. 
But I don't think people necessarily want to wear things on their heads or their faces, right? I mean, think about right. we're living in the middle of this with with masking, you know, right? And obviously, it's become a political issue in many respects. But I don't think any people feel obligation to you right. know, do it for the right reasons. But I don't think anybody's sitting here saying I love wearing a mask for an extended period of time. Yeah. Um. So I I think that that's the same thing. Like the experience has to be compelling enough to overcome that natural hurdle. And so where I ultimately gravitate to in thinking about the metaverse is it's going to be about those experiences that you want to be immersed in, right? So the applications we've talked about, you know, sitting front row at, at a basketball game or being front row at a concert, those things are really high engagement experiences. Mm-hmm. But to me, those like, I think of those as things people should be maybe paying for commerce experiences <laughs> rather than right. than necessarily something that is, is supported by advertising. And they're not experiences where you're spending a long time doing them. No one sits at a basketball game for like eight hours straight or even multiple days in a row. It's you go, you're there for two to three hours, you get up and you move on with your life. So that, that was going to be my next question, which you kind of already answered. But outside of attending live sporting events and being transported to, you know, uh, get a perspective which you might not ordinarily be able to because courtside seats are, you know, you have to give away your first child for them. Do you see any other killer apps on the horizon which could actually bring the metaverse back into perspective for some people? Uh, traveling to different time and places. That seems cool. It's very interesting. Mm. You know, we've talked about it for fitness. I'm actually even a little bit more torn on that. Fitness in some respects seems like it could be cool, but also like, I don't know if I want to be doing exercise with something on my face. Well, on that point, there was, there was an article, <laughs> uh, I forget where it was now, it was in the Times, but it was talking about injuries through virtual reality headsets. There's actually, I think, a Reddit <laughs> threads vr to er people whirling around and like hitting significant others or breaking their limbs because they don't know where they are so that is legitimate concern even if you can get over the motion sickness which a lot of people have banging into stuff still seems to be a bit of a problem yeah all of these things so right so at the end of the day i think we're kind of saying that that there could be very cool applications for high engagement experiences but I'm, I'm just not going to sit around with something on my head. I have to have something to yeah. do. And you, you hear about some of these experiences where, you know, people will go to like a, a virtual party and they're just kind of like standing around, milling about, find a random yeah. person to talk to. I don't know. It sounds like it might be interesting the first time and then you get bored of it pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah. Well, so there's an article from Jason Ayton, Inc.com, and he goes through why the, the biggest reason Facebook's metaverse strategy will, will fail, and he actually points to a couple of things, but you mentioned this right at the top when you were explaining kind of your hypothesis, and one of them was that Facebook's not great at making hardware. I mean, yes, you have Oculus, but they also have a portal, um, which is not done as nearly as well as they hoped, then they're also not great at making software, he, he argues. The Facebook app isn't particularly user-friendly or, or well-designed. So I, I guess my question is, is this, you know, metaverse not being, the metaverse not being the next iteration of the mobile internet, is it because Facebook is at the helm and they're leading the charge and taking it in a direction which may not be be the best kind of mass market use case. Like if you swap out Facebook and replace them with Apple and it's through augmented reality glasses that they're supposedly going to be releasing in the next couple of years, does it become a much more appealing concept? Short answer to that is yes. But let me first say on on Facebook, I think they actually, from what I've read and from what I can tell, make good hardware. Facebook portal has gotten great reviews as a hardware product. I think the lack of adoption has more to do with the lack of trust in the brand Mm. surrounding it. Fair. And, you know, Oculus too seems like it's best in class in VR hardware. So I think they're probably fine on that dimension. It, it's much more about who's doing it. But then, so you say, what if Apple was doing it? I'd still have the view that I think it is more likely to be the next generation evolution of gaming, which again, isn't nothing. It's a pretty important vehicle, but there may be some limits to how much time you will spend doing it and to which audiences ultimately will, will enter those worlds. Yeah. All right. Let's take a quick word from our sponsor, Mountain, and then we'll be right back talking about some uh, of the bad parts of the metaverse, if it ends up being a thing.
What if launching a streaming TV ad campaign was as easy as posting on social media? With Mountain, it is. Their marketing software solution offers an easy way to buy, manage, and measure connected TV campaigns. Ads are served exclusively on premium streaming networks and apps and optimized by automated media buying technology to ensure ads are served to the right viewer at the right time to prompt website visits and conversions. Visit mountain.com to learn more. All right, we're back. In the first half, we talked about why Andrew in particular thinks the, the metaverse might not be the next generation of the internet. And we wanted to, in the second half, talk all about the, the kind of bad parts of the metaverse. If it does end up existing in what seems, I'd say it's current form, who knows what it bloody is at this point, but existing in some way, shape or form. And uh, there's a fair amount of concerns. One of the big ones is, is privacy. Come the metaverse, can privacy exist in immersive worlds, new technologies will siphon up data at an increasingly granular level. A person's gait, eye movements, emotions, and more, putting far greater strain on existing safeguards, writes David Uberty of the Wall Street Journal. He continues by saying that privacy advocates are leery of the intentions of a company like Meta that in recent years has paid billions of dollars to the US and EU regulators over alleged data abuses. Far-reaching and arguably intensive data processing is key to such companies' ad-based business models, critics say. So Andrew, I'm wondering what your thoughts are here on the idea of privacy. And and it kind of got me thinking, and I want to talk about this in, in another episode, the kind of business models, the business side of the metaverse, how people are going to really make money in the metaverse. But it did get me thinking, what's the business model here, particularly for Facebook? Are we sure that it's ads? Does it absolutely 100% have to be ads? Or is there another way that they can make money from this, which maybe it's majority ads, but maybe it's not? I think commerce and taking a cut of commerce, however it exists, I don't know Mm -hmm. exactly what forms uh, are most likely to materialize, but that probably seems like a healthier alignment of incentives. We've seen what the digital advertising model has has wrought in many instances. And certainly if it's commerce driven, then you remove a lot of the incentive for digital surveillance. Yeah. I mean, there's a great example to that point. Second Life each month that counts more than 700,000 active users who hang out together and buy and sell virtual goods using uh, Linden dollars, each worth about a quarter of a penny in transactions. That added up to about $650 million annually. Linden monetizes the activity through paid subscriptions and services to users, as well as by selling its payment platform to other developers as well. So maybe there is a world, yeah, where they lean away from advertising, focus more on commerce, particularly because precise information on where people are looking can reveal users' subconscious thinking or mental state, according to Yuar Hao Lan, professor at Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands, uh, who is leading one of the projects funded by Meta. Users may look differently at other players in the game. For example, if you're looking at an avatar of your boss who you don't like, you'll look at them differently than you would look at a colleague who you might like. So there's there's so much data that can be gathered. And if people aren't comfortable with the current amounts of data that can be gathered, then maybe advertising isn't going to be the main form of monetization. Yeah, it reminds me of digital fingerprinting, which exists today for digital ads, for example, where you know essentially if, if you can get access to different settings on somebody's device, then with a high degree of probability, you can figure out who that user is. Yeah. Now you you take that and you digitize the way people behave in these digital environments, right? The way we act in the real world is not digitized today in most instances. So that, that becomes a little bit scarier in terms of using that kind of fingerprinting on steroids. And the implications are much more significant, especially as you mentioned, if people could be targeted, not just for advertising experiences, but what if it is to take advantage of people? What about recruiting them mm-hmm. to different groups or things like that? I mean, you can think about kind of the, the worst places that something like that can go. All of that concerns me. Yeah. Another serious concern within the world of the metaverse, harassment, assaults, bullying, and hate speech, something that we already experience 
on the, the current iteration of the internet and already run rampant in virtual reality games, which are part of the metaverse. And there are few mechanisms to easily report the misbehavior, researchers said, according to a recent piece by Shira Frenkel and Kellen Browning of the New York Times. In one popular virtual reality game, VR Chat, a violating incident occurs about once every seven minutes, according to the nonprofit Center for Countering Digital Hate. Andrew, circling back to what we were saying at the very end of the, the kind of first half of the show, Facebook not being good at hardware or software, and you could argue those points. Another point Jason Aiton makes in an Inc.com article was that it's not great at moderating content. Yeah, and, and the content moderation needs become exponential here, right? It's not content moderation. It's, it's also, you know, people moderation. Yes. And yeah, I mean, if you think about what's happened with the toxicity and harassment that exists on social media and other communication channels today, that doesn't involve, you know, a level of pseudo reality and tactile sensation. You start to get into the potential for some pretty scary uh, types of harassment mm -hmm. and, and it's already happening, right? It's happening with frequency in these environments. Uh, the scale is, is relatively limited today. I don't know if something has to happen before a universe, a metaverse like this becomes much, much bigger because these problems are going to multiply. Yeah. Yeah. It talks about frequency, some, some fascinating numbers uh, related to that. Callum Hood, the head of research at the Center for Countering Digital Hate, spent several weeks recording interactions in the VR chat game that I mentioned before, largely played through Oculus Quest headsets where people form virtual communities, play cards, you can party in virtual clubs, things like that. During an 11 hour period, Mr. Hood he said he recorded over 100 problematic incidents, sexual and violent threats on VR chat, some involving users under the age of 13, which is just, I mean, it's horrifying that the amount of frequency that that one you know, small sample was able to pick up on. And there is a general concern, you know, it, about content moderation and people moderation, but particularly with children. Andy Burroughs, Head of Child Safety Online Policy at the National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children, expressing concerns about the safety of virtual environments. And it seems, Andrew, that Facebook kind of is admitting that you, you can't moderate this world. Last March, Meta Executive Andrew Bosworth, who will become the CTO this year, wrote in an employee memo that moderating what people say and how they act in the metaverse at any meaningful scale is practically impossible, which is not very encouraging at all. And part of the reason for that is because misbehavior in the virtual reality world is very difficult to track because everything is happening in, in real time and things typically aren't recorded. I don't see how they get around this, to be honest. Right. I mean, there, there's an obligation if you are going to steward these environments into reality to help police it, right? I mean, we expect a level of policing in the real world. We're not getting, we expect, but we're not getting appropriate levels of, of content moderation in the digital world as it exists today, Web 2. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can see we're getting into this very gray area where the lines are starting to blur and the complexity and potential for problems is huge. And I don't think it's okay to say hands off, there's no way we're going to police it. Even if you can't yeah. police things to you know perfection, you know, a few things can be policed or governed that way. To basically throw your hands up and say that you're not going to try is, is really problematic. Yes. Finally, on this, Titania Jordan, Chief Parent Officer at Bark, which uses AI to monitor children's devices for safety reasons, especially concerned about what kids might encounter in the metaverse, saying abusers could target children through chat messages in a game or by speaking to them through headsets which again, actions very difficult to document. Miss Jordan saying just the ability to pinpoint somebody in VR who is a bad actor and then block them indefinitely or have ramifications so they can't get back on, those are still being developed. So it's incredibly hard to just block someone and hope they don't show up somewhere else as someone else. That's all we've got time for, for the lead story. Time now for the halftime report. Andrew, uh, we talked about a lot with regards to whether the metaverse will be the next generation of the mobile internet and the bad parts of the metaverse, the potential metaverse. Uh, one or two takeaways from you? So my key takeaway for the first part is that mass media vehicles tend towards passive consumption. We can call that Lipsman's law, Marcus. You know, there's oh, Metcalf's law, nice. there's Moore's law. So mass media vehicles tend towards passive consumption. The metaverse, I think, is by definition, not passive, it's immersive. So therefore, I don't think it will be a mass media vehicle. 
There it is, ladies and gentlemen. We'll see. It's time now for In Other News. Today, in other news, what is the main reason that shoppers abandon their cart? And also, the number one reason people buy things on Amazon. Story one. Nearly half of shoppers who go from cart to checkout still don't buy something, according to e-commerce technology company Bold Commerce. They found that just over 5 out of 10 computer shoppers and 4 out of 10 smartphone shoppers that make their way to the checkout actually complete their purchase. Why? Well, some people want to review or edit their orders. Mobile shoppers who convert to buyers are 41% more likely to review or edit their order at checkout. Also, multi-page mobile checkouts can yield a better conversion than single-page ones where you scroll down, apparently. Also, as shipping fees increase, checkout completion goes down. And finally, retailers aren't offering the right payment methods or might not be PayPal, BMPL, uh, buy now, pay later options, uh, things like that. Andrew, in your opinion, the main reason shoppers abandon their cart is blank. I think it comes down to two things. Wrong payment method, which it mentions. Mm. And also, last minute shift in your thinking based on perception of value. So what do I mean there? For me, if you get to the end and you don't have that free shipping, right? That all of a sudden that shifts your thinking a bit. The other one is coupon codes. When you get to the checkout, you see that empty space for coupon code. You're like, hmm, I got to go search for a coupon code. <laughs> you go yep. search for one, you don't find one. And then you're like, oh, all right, I'm not going to buy this. Yeah. It actually shifts your thinking. So I think retailers should always think about having something. It doesn't have to be a big discount, but something nominal in order to enable that. And then Apple Pay, lack of, for me, that's my preferred digital wallet. If Apple Pay isn't there and I, I see that you know some of them will have like PayPal and Amazon Pay and Shop Pay, but no Apple Pay, that's a total friction point. And I absolutely abandon checkout when that happens. Yeah. That's a, I mean, all great points, but the, particularly the one on uh, the coupon codes, well, a lot of the sites, um, retail sites I've been on, they offer you a coupon code within the first four seconds of you landing on the page. Like, Give me your email address and we'll give you all this money off. It's like, whoa, I just got here. Can you <laughs> wait a second? But that would be a perfect time when I'm at that point in the checkout to say, hey, here's 10% off. Hey, throw this code in and, uh, and we'll give you a little money back. Uh, story two, what's the number one reason people buy things on Amazon? According to a recent Digital Commerce 360 BizRate Insight survey, it's that people can find almost anything they need on Amazon. 66% said that. Then it's because they're a Prime member, 56%. Then it's because they can quickly find what they're looking for, 51%. So that went, they can find almost anything, they're a Prime member, and then they can quickly find what they're looking for. In fourth place was Amazon offering competitive prices, 47% of people saying that. But Andrew, the biggest takeaway from this survey for you was blank. It's about ease. Amazon's all about ease. They really pioneered or, or understood early on that the fundamentals of purchasing are about price selection and convenience. And if you talk through those top responses, they all ultimately align with those factors. Amazon really kind of was built on the idea of selection as the everything store and, and hitting on the long tail of books originally and then doing that across other categories. Then they built the marketplace that drove down pricing. So now you have confidence that you're going to get a great price at Amazon. And now we're in the convenience era where it's all about fast and free delivery. So those are the fundamentals. Amazon's ticked the boxes in all of them and really kind of led the whole e-commerce ecosystem along those paths. So it should be no surprise that uh, Amazon has been as successful as it has been. And that is all we have time for. Thank you, Andrew, for hanging out. Thanks, Marcus. Thank you to Victoria. She edits the show. Thanks to everyone listening. We'll see you tomorrow, hopefully, for another episode of the Behind the Numbers Daily, an e-marketer podcast made possible by Mountain. Can anyone else just spell no words anymore? I like type in like the first two letters of the word I think I'm trying to spell into Google. I'm like, figure it out. You, fi you know what I'm trying to say, figure it out. Are you saying that you have fat finger syndrome or you forgot how to actually spell them? I yeah, the second one. Yeah. I haven't lost the spelling. Yeah, it's embarrassing. Like it comes back with a- definitely thing. spell. But I will say I have certain words that when I type them, there's like an impediment in my brain where it, ha it has to come out wrong every time I do it. One of those words is ratio. It will come out ration. But sometimes in Google, I'll, I'll type a word in and it's, I'll type it with like a starting with like a PA. And Google's like, did you mean this word? It starts with like a T. I'm like, what the? Sh pterodactyl? Is that the one? So bad. <laughs> oh.